So my name is Devin Snell, my business partner with Stranger Martino. We'd like to introduce ourselves as arts advocates, community builders, creative entrepreneurs, and placemakers. Uh, I'm born and raised in Broward County in Fort Lauderdale, and the arts have had a profound impact on our lives. And we wanted to bring this impact that we've seen work in places like Soho and Asheville and in Wynwood, which is the arts district in Miami, to our community in Fort Lauderdale, where we didn't really have so many platforms to highlight and showcase local artists and creatives back when we got started a few years ago. So we are arts advocates. And uh, initially, we started with a social movement where um, there wasn't really a cultivation of culture and community from like a marketing perspective. I went to uh, Memphis, Tennessee, where I saw the impact of a social movement called Shoes 901, which they were using as a recruitment tool to recruit teachers, paramedics, and firefighters who want to live and work in Memphis, telling people that Memphis uh, wasn't just becoming a great place, it already was a great place. I came back from that trip, supercharged, inspired, and started something called Choose 954 to cultivate culture and community, to keep people to know with all the great things that are going on, to make our community a better place to live, and not just a better place to vacation, because it already is a great place to vacation. So we started doing a lot of social media marketing, visual storytelling, podcasts for artists. We built a newsletter that we send bi-weekly culture roundups to, to uh, over 20,000 subscribers that are seeking arts and culture. And then, we felt the calling to do more. We needed to create physical activations and platforms, Thailand showcase artists and creatives. Um, one of the major restaurant groups in downtown Fort Lauderdale, uh, the restaurant people, PRP, asked us to bring in local artists every Wednesday night during their ladies' night, which was one of the slower nights midweek, to live paint and create this activation, engaging activation, where artists would not just be displaying their works, but actually creating their works um, every Wednesday night. And it was a really great opportunity because this is on our main street in downtown Fort Lauderdale, high foot traffic, high income area. Um, and it gave a lot of artists their first opportunity ever to exhibit, ever to pop up, ever to live paint. At this point, live painting was not so much of a thing. And now you think of it a few years later, there was an artist that was live painting here at this conference today. Uh, we ran this initiative for over three years weekly. We had a, 150 artists participate. We called it the Choose 954 local artist discovery series that she did run up until COVID. And then essentially we realized we needed to create more platforms, bigger platforms, to highlight and showcase our local artists and creatives. We never had, a, any of you guys familiar with this little thing that happens the first week of December called Art Basel? Okay, it's the largest art fair in the world. It drives over a million tourists and uh, contributes over a billion dollars of economic impact to Miami's economy every year. It is the largest thing in, in uh, in the world for art, it literally has contributed to the redevelopment and revitalization of Miami as a well-cultured mecca for arts and culture. So while we were doing this Choose 954 thing, we realized we needed a bigger platform. And why don't you tell us a little bit about how we created that? And, and so, so we decided that you know, instead of doing an art fair like many other art fairs are either in a convention center or um, under a tent, we would try to utilize some things that are unique to our community to be able to showcase art in a different way. So what we did was uh, we created an art fair that was uh, hosted in luxury waterfront homes on the Intracoastal, and people would get there by water taxi. So when you start thinking about like things that you want to do to make make you know your particular art fair or or things that happen in other cities unique, look at the things that are sort of unique to your community. And so what we did was, again, hosted this, and we can probably play. My name is Evan Snow. I'm one of the co-founders and managing partners of Art Fort Lauderdale, the Art Fair on the Water. I'm Andrew Martineau, co-founder of Art Fort Lauderdale and also the curatorial director for this fair. We never had a signature four-day art fair in Fort Lauderdale or even in Broward County. So we decided to create a revolutionary art fair taking place exclusively inside luxury waterfront homes made only accessible via boat. If you're really on a curated experience, we're really kind of looking at like how people experience work within an environment of a group of people that you're with for the entire journey. We really kind of like calm the whole experience down as opposed to it being very hectic. 
one of the really unique things is having the art in the homes versus a traditional tent or convention center. Even for a savvy art patron, most people get art fatigue going to these art fairs. So within this environment, we're able to actually place work in the place where they'll eventually live and where people would kind of like see it every day. We've kind of placed the pieces, you know, in the bathroom above the bathtub or in the bedroom above the bed head. We are a primarily independent artist driven art fair. It's so tough for an independent artist not represented by a gallery to exhibit in a major fair. The barrier to entry is so high, it's thousands of dollars. And if you're even represented by a gallery. So we made it inclusive. So artists of any level, emerging, established, local, national, international, or otherwise can exhibit on our county's largest platform. One of the main focal points with the art fair is each home is a different exhibit. As we start selecting the works for the fair, we kind of match the works with the homes that we're gonna be in. So this home that we're in right now is more of a modern contemporary home, recently built, and we wanted to have a lot of bright light, um, bright light and bright colors kind of coming through. And a lot of the work kind of represents a lot of that. A lot of the work's also very modern contemporary pieces. So we have three homes this year, uh, serving as our exhibit locations, two of which are independent artist exhibitions for artists not represented by a gallery. We also are very excited to have added a Bahamas House exhibition, benefiting the Grand Bahamas Children's House, which was unfortunately damaged by Hurricane Dorian with a portion of proceeds so that they can help rebuild and actually resume their art programs, which unfortunately they had to put on pause as a result of the hurricane. I'm Jennifer Nyack. I'm welcoming you to Bahamas House. I am a collector and I'm a curator and I'm an arts and culture writer. I know these artists personally and I was devastated to find out that so many of my favorite galleries that I like to go to were closing. So the artwork in this room is Lori Touchell. She's a uh, Grand Bahamian based artist. She uses a lot of layering effect with her colors and she paints a lot of day in the life scenes. So these are actual moments. So this is an example of the Junkanoo pieces that were sent over from Grand Bahama. One thing that's interesting about the Bahamas is that all of the materials that artists use are shipped in. So you have to use the most basic things. And when you look and see how they used, this artist used recycled lawn material. I think this might even be like a child's chair. Uh, they use staples, masking tape, glue, and paint. And if you feel the weight of this, it is about 20 pounds, 25 pounds. Imagine dancing through the streets wearing this on your head. These are handed down generation from generation, year after year, because the artistry is so good, but also the engineering. Caroline Anderson's work is really probably my most um, poignant and my most important and expressive from my post-hurricane pieces that were given to me. Um, these talk about the destruction and the experience of going through the hurricane. So it's a lot easier, obviously, to show you than it is just to tell you. Um, but our mission with this art fair, with this project, was to put Fort Lauderdale on the art world map as an international destination to interact with art and is evidenced by us getting press coverage in Forbes, CNN Travel, NPR, PBS, local press. We succeeded in our mission in doing so, even if we didn't become the next art puzzle. Uh, the last installment of the fair ran in January of 2020. We do plan to bring it back at some point in the future. But this fair led to us creating some additional platforms to highlight and showcase some of the economic impacts of the creative economy. And you know, we, we always find the creative economy is an important thing to talk about because you know, attracting and retaining talent is, is a huge part of economies and we wanted to showcase how uh, you know, including artists and bringing artists in the community and, and highlighting artists could also tie into generating economic impact. So we host every year um, uh, a whole conference with, with, with different people, so local commissioners, local business people, other artists, and we talk about how art and business really kind of work together and how you know you think about like companies that want to relocate to other areas they want to relocate the places that have this thriving cultural environment and how those things tie together so every year we host this event we have the cultural vision director or a local commissioner or a business person and we really have that dialogue between the community and these people about different things that happen so that's another another little piece of i guess the connection of things that we do there to be able to highlight the arts and really showcase how those things really move things forward. 
But at the heart of what we do, we're independent private citizens that are passionate community builders, seeing the power and the impact of the arts to build a community. So when COVID came around, uh, we wanted to find ways to bring people together as we're all going through, obviously, everything with the pandemic. But we thought, well, we love hosting tours, and we'll talk about some of the other tours that we do. But what's a way that we could bring people together in a socially distant, active way? We, um, I was diagnosed with diabetes at the beginning of the pandemic, and I started prioritizing my health. We wanted to encourage others to consider their health. Um, I love riding my bicycle. Fort Lauderdale has a very interesting landscape from a, one of the closest proximities to downtown to the beach. So we put together an annual 954 day as part of our Choose 954 social movement, September 5th at 4 p.m. with an annual bike ride, which allowed us to bring people together in a socially distant fashion and show them some of the greater parts of Fort Lauderdale that maybe they never discovered before, like this Victoria Park neighborhood, some of the murals throughout some of our arts districts. And then this led the way to other tours. Uh, we work with our local MPO who obtained a grant from the Better Bike Share program where they had us lead tours specifically of the murals, bringing in local artists like a spoken word poet um, to give our community maybe their first ever interaction and exposure to a spoken word artist and actually pay those artists um, supporting local coffee shops and tea shops and supporting mm -hmm. local people in the community to once again further this sense of community and the sense of place, which we're very big on, as I mentioned, creating platforms to highlight various artists and creatives and creatives uh, come in various shapes and sizes and various industries. So there's another platform we created here. And and it's 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 always a family affair. So my wife is really very involved in woman empowerment and we got really uh, involved in the craft beer space. So she is um, started one of the pioneering um, beer festivals focused on women in brewing. And it started about seven years ago. And it was when nobody was really thinking about women were actually brewing beer or owned, owned breweries or co-owned breweries. So we started about seven years ago. Um, it happens every year in Fort Lauderdale. But it was this, it's this very, very unique event that happens there where we bring brewers and brewery owners that are all women from all the country. We have a female DJ. Men are invited to attend, but the women are the ones that are making the beer and talking to people. So now people that are, that are attending now have an opportunity to be able to chat with women and kind of figure out the things that they're doing within the brewing industry. So this is another event that we kind of do as local residents, you know, following our passions and finding all the passions of other people that we share. And we did, we did this iteration of it at a local boutique hotel, which was not on the main A1A Ocean Drive. It was kind of behind in the shadows of the W Hotel and the Ritz and the Hilton Hotel. And it provided a great marketing opportunity for this little boutique hotel to have people discover it, which is super charming. Um, and it's, once again, another great place-making initiative to bring people together over our shared passions um, and highlight these, their, these respective creators in their respective industries, also supporting nonprofits in the process as well. This has earned Andrew's wife, who didn't make it here to this uh, conference because she's taking care of the baby at home, uh, <laughs> press coverage in Oprah Magazine, uh, Thrillist, and various uh, publications, which once again put our community on the map as a destination for tourists to explore the Boston Civic Pride um, and have that sense of place within the community. And then also in this process, I made a couple trips to Mexico. We discovered a love for mezcal, and we realized it wasn't really a mezcal festival. So got really obsessed with mezcal um, for numerous reasons, and started del delving into it, started looking for other places that I can go try mezcal. Didn't really find any other places in North America, so figured it was another opportunity to create another unique event in our city that doesn't happen anywhere else in North America, and started Mezcal Lardale. We hosted at a, a local um, a hotel, the Meridian Hotel, that had a tequila bar. And we had, for the first year, in its first iteration, had over 30 Mezcal brands. Uh, also ended up partnering up with the, um, the Mexican consulate. And uh, probably had about 500 attendees over a weekend. And then we also hosted a sustainability conference towards the, the begin actually beginning of it, where we talked about sustainability within the agave space which is becoming more and more of an issue where because mezcal is becoming more popular, there's actually more um, mezcal that's being planted and taken away. So we had a, a, a sustainability panel with the various brands and people that were involved in it to come talk about how they are sustainable 
within um, planting the agave and also making them the scale. So we did that one year at um, Lemuridian, and last year we did another restaurant called Canyon, and we did it on the outside area. We're working on it next year, and we're talking to a couple other locations within Fort Lauderdale to be able to host that again. Um, and the Mexican American Chamber of Commerce and other Mexican. So the idea is, you know, creating unique events in the city that don't happen really anywhere else that I enjoy personally as a personal resident, but it also kind of gives another reason to come to our city to be engaged in these things. And, you know, what, what, what was, I think, one of the interesting things that came out of it, everybody said, hey, why don't you host this in Miami? And that's what we always get. You know, you do a really unique event, and the expectation is it'll be in Miami. Of course, I said, well, that won't happen because all the events that we do are in Broward because that's where I live, and, and that's, that's what we, we want to we try to encourage. So, so that's just another example of things that you can do, again, as local residents that have passionate things about things that they like and figure out ways to get more people together. And this is a master class, so <laughs> the second portion of this master class, we are going to turn it and pose some questions you in the audience to think of ways that you might be able to create similar platforms like this for your community. Now, this started for me because I attended a monthly breakfast lecture series and many TED Talks that takes place in 200 cities around the world. Is anybody familiar with Creative Mornings? Okay, it's uh, where I received my aha moment and I decided, um, because I literally was just a recruiter, a Johnny Nine to Five recruiter sitting at a desk, started listening to some TED Talks, Fortunately, I had a friend and mentor that shared that love of TED Talks. He was renting space in the co-working space. He said, oh, there's this really cool event that's taking place in my building. Why don't you come check it out? And on the third one I attended, I received some inspiration in the form of an aha moment that I attribute now that led me down this path of arts, culture, and community building, literally transitioning from being a recruiter to a food blogger to a culture blogger and cultural curator. And then fortunately, shortly thereafter, meeting this young man who already had experience in the community and um, I guess this would maybe to give you guys some context as to why the branding and the content and the marketing and all and everything you see is at such a level. Andrew, very humbly, uh, has been in the advertising marketing space for 20 years. Uh, he went to the International Fine Arts College. He was involved with some of the largest advertising agencies, Saatchi, GWC. He's been past president of the American Advertising Federation. He did marketing for some of the largest home builders, uh, some of the largest tourism operators. Cruise Line, he developed a logo for our Main Street, Los Angeles Boulevard, which is still used to this day. So fortunately, he's a Swiss Army knife of skills. And one of the things that, you know, we're, we're going to paint the picture as part of this masterclass. We do all of this internally, all the services, the logo, the website, the branding, the public relations, to absorb the cost. Because if we had to pay agencies $3,000 a month five for that and $5,000 a month for this, we might not have been able to keep all these things affordable um, for the people that are participating in them. Because like the art fair, first year we didn't charge anybody to participate. Second year we charged $90 for an artist to exhibit a piece of art. The third year we charged $180. The fourth year we charged $250. For an artist to get into Miami Art Basel, I mean, if you can even get in as an independent artist, it's tens of thousands of dollars, potentially hundreds of thousands of dollars. So no independent artist is ever going to pay that to get into one of these major fairs, but because we're very passionate, altruistic community builders, creative entrepreneurs that have a lot of resources and skills, we utilize those skills to keep the cost down for the participants and keep also everything's very inclusive. We pay our emerging mid-career and established artists on the art fair and in some of the other platforms you're going to see together. And we don't just make these opportunities available for the established artists that have an MFA or a long CV like a lot of traditional art programs you'll find. So this is another placemaking initiative that we do and part of the takeaway we want to share with you guys are these are transferable programs that you can apply to your destination, to your community. This happens in over 200 cities around the world. Um, and you can bring in local people to share their thought-provoking, inspiring story, provide a little coffee and breakfast. We now do it at a Nova Southeastern University private university in Broward County, where Andrew is actually the president of the Circle of Friends for the library, the board for the library, um, because the library wasn't doing so much great programming and events, and they wanted to drive in a new audience. They wanted to drive in new traffic. So we started hosting this event um, at the library. It's created a lot of great connections, a lot of new continuing education opportunities, a lot more inspiration. And we just love bringing people together over our shared passions. And when you do that, we've come to find and I've heard this theme now, I've heard this 
this thread in a lot of the presentations provides an opportunity for creative collision, provides an opportunity for people to bump into one another. And then that's maybe where a business idea sparks or a partnership, or we've even had people meet their romantic partners and get married from coming to these events. And that's just something that we're very passionate about, as you can begin to see. But we are very entrepreneurial with these ventures, so I'll let Andrew tell you about one of our favorite events here. <laughs> Um, so, so we're passionate about fashion. Um, at the time, we didn't really have any major fashion events in Broward. Uh, the W Hotel had just redone their wet deck upstairs. Uh, they had a $40 million renovation. They were looking for ways to attract people there. So we hosted an event called the Art of Swim. It was more of an interactive sort of fashion event. Uh, became one of the largest uh, attended events there in, in, in Broward and also at the hotel. There were lines all around the block. Uh, we had five, six different different designers and tons and tons of people and became another opportunity for the hotel to drive F&B sales, but it also be an opportunity for us to have a really great platform to create a really unique event. Um, the, the, the W Hotel has an acrylic pool, and so we got these uh, people that were dressed as mermaids. So as you're coming up the stairs, you can see mermaids through swimming in the water. We had our acrylic um, deck, so the, the models were actually walking over the water. So a very, very interactive and very different sort of event. So we like to kind of create memories for people whenever they come and attend any of our events. And so this was one of them called Art of Swim that we hosted at W and really kind of kicked off a long-standing relationship with the W. Um, we're starting to partner with them now. So now we're a, a co-partner of their Halloween events, their New Year's Eve events, and they've been really great partners of ours as we continue to do more things with more partners in our destination. And as we're doing the art fair, uh, we, made, we made this a destination event. Now, it would be great just to come in just for the art fair, but we didn't want to limit it there. Uh, if you ever go to Miami Art Basel, Miami Art Week, or any of the major art weeks, there's generally a series of really cool after parties. So we wanted to create that for our community, for the locals and the visitors alike. This is, once again, through the relationship that we established at the W. We brought in um, some really cool artists, DJs, musicians. Uh, there was a, um, a photographer out of Brooklyn who's from South Florida, who does these things called light bash, where you essentially you pose in front of an artistic lighting setup and it creates a really cool uh, image that you're able to keep. And then we also bring in performance artists. Kiki Moore is a very big fashion designer um, and performance artist, living sculpture artist. Uh, we bring in local artists to paint, musicians and DJs. Uh, we have artists painting the Moet bottles. Um, so it's a really cool opportunity. These events have um, all been a part of some of the largest uh, F&B record evening in the W's history by bringing in 800 people, 1,000 people, when, you know, maybe the W might get 100 people on Saturday night in all reality. So, and, and it wasn't just the W, so, you know, we did the W, we did the Ritz, we did the Conrad, and, um... Mar, oh, Pier 66, the Bonnet House, mm. which is one of our historical mm. uh, museums. So every night there was a different event at a different location, for and for a lot of people, there were a lot of times that it was the first time they've ever been there, especially the Bonnet House is a good example, a really great um, botanical garden that we have in our, in our city, but a lot of people don't necessarily go there on a regular day. So we created these unique opportunities for people to visit locations in our city, and also for even the people that are coming in from a journalism standpoint, to be able to get a full experience from the, from the events, from the art fair in the, in the morning, all the way to the parties at night. And the art fair that we were doing, we would charter water taxis. The water taxis could fit 60 people. Um, the homes, we wanted to be mindful that you could only fit so many people in these homes. We capped the attendance of the event at 4,000 people. It was a $100 ticket. Now, that obviously didn't allow us to include everybody that wanted to attend or exhibit in the art fair. So we created, as I previously alluded to, um, a platform to highlight all of the arts and culture institutions and artists that we know and love throughout the 31 cities that make up for our county. And we created Fort Lauderdale Art and Design Week to provide self-guided discovery tours of the arts to the locals um, and the visitors alike, creating these really unique opportunities, creative collisions. So there's after parties, uh, artist studio tours, talks. We heard from the American Institute of Architects that participated in some of our first artist talks that architects were having to leave to go other places to obtain projects to work on to build their portfolio. They wanted a platform to highlight and showcase the local architects through the American Institute of Architects for a larger chapter. We help support them in creating an architecture fair that takes place during our week as well. 
Um, also, it's created mural festivals. Uh, Broward County Culture Division now funds a light projection project called Ignite Broward, which you can see some examples of there. Um, and although the art fair hasn't continued after COVID until we get some more funding to support you know, people, um, we do continue to do the art week, which we're very excited to bring back for the 16th annual installment. Now, you can see there was a lot of content. There was a lot of rich, engaging visuals, videos. Uh, we were working with Finn Partners, who's the agency of record for our Greater Fort Lauderdale Convention and Visitors Bureau. And they said, um, we want to submit this campaign to the PRSA, Public Relations Service Association, uh, for some awards. And they did, and we won. And we beat out over 800 submissions uh, that showed, as you can see here in this graphic, this event from when we started in 2018 to 2020, increased hotel revenues and, and room nights, and obviously we all know about the bed tax, heads and beds, year over year, through the media tactics and campaigns that we were producing by providing these engaging quality visual recaps um, and we were blown away. We won uh, Destination on Demand. We won Media Tactics. We won a bunch of awards that we didn't even know we were considering. We we're just doing what we thought was the right thing to do as passionate citizens, community builders, placemakers, creative entrepreneurs, and thankfully marketers. And a lot of the recaps, uh, we hire local uh, photographers, local videographers. So we're also paying people that are come doing, um, doing the coverage and creating the content, catching the content, which you could then use to then promote the destination and also promote the things that we're doing there as well. So, and in there, uh, when, and I want to give you guys additional context of, we were all affected by COVID, everyone was affected by COVID. <laughs> so we, uh, during COVID, obviously we had the pivot, but we wanted to create, uh, continue the art discourse series of artist talks. So we did spin it up virtually. Um, and we were able to bring in some of the biggest names within the arts and culture in Broward County. Pre Prabha, who's our South Florida Culture Consortium winner annually, Francie Bishop Hood, the owner and founder of the Girls Club, the largest collection of uh, women created art in the world, one of the biggest supporters of the arts. So we can give our community through this art discourse series proper access to brilliant minds speaking about different topics within the arts and culture, not just art making, but even art restoration. And throughout that series of events, we talk about creative collisions, we've had some amazing creative solutions happen. Yeah, I mean, uh, for, for one of the Art Discourse series, we brought the curator from the Brooklyn Museum to come speak. We had her um, uh, do a talk moderated by Bonnie Clearwater, who is the curator of our amazing museum there. And then after that talk and that conversation and that, that, that relationship, um, the, the curator then became the first black curator of the Guggenheim. And then it also led to a series of new shows at the museum that turned into one with a, with a gentleman called Eric Mack, who had a really incredible exhibit in Brooklyn that Bonnie was interested in bringing to our local museum. But then Eric Mack also went to school with Kehinde Wiley, and then it turned into a whole another exhibit with a bunch of different artists that all went to Yale, and we, we eventually had a, a Kehinde Wiley exhibit there as well. So all of these connections based on us creating a platform for these things to happen turned into a bunch of different sort of unexpected collisions that turned into really great things in our community. And Kendi Wiley, how many of you know who Kendi Wiley is? He's the, he's the painter that painted that epic Obama portrait. And actually, he has a sculpture in front of the BMFA, which if you haven't been to the BMFA, yes. it's one of the finest museums in the country. Um, so I promise you we're getting the zero implications. I promise you we're getting there. But you know, we don't like sitting still, obviously. Uh, we're doing all this, we're having the creative collisions happen, and some artists come and they say, I want to put sculptures on top of rocks and put them in the ocean and call them artificial reefs. I told them politely, I don't know what that means. They showed me a documentary called Chasing Coral, it was made by the people that made Conspiracy. And uh, at this time, it was becoming more publicized. Our coral reefs were dying in Southeast Florida, where we have one of the largest reef tracks in the world. Corals are an immense tremendous economic driver um, and provide immense benefits, social protection, I can go on and on. And we like to view art as a problem solver. So we came up with this initiative and um, we wanted to create sculptures in the form of mermaids that we put on top of these engineered artificial reef structures that are six feet by six feet and weigh 3,500 pounds. 
And um, thankfully, we found a very resourceful landscape architect, architect, stone expert who had his own concrete facility, who happened to love the reefs and love diving, uh, love diving, and had seen how the reefs had been impacted over his lifetime. And we partnered with him to create something called the Thousand Mermaid Dark Fisher Reef Project uh, to create, you know, ecotourism benefits, opportunities for research and discovery, um, coastal protection. The list goes on and on and on with the benefits. These reefs, and it's earned us once again a lot of notoriety and press coverage. So obviously, this is Good Morning America, um, and the press has been very generous. With this initiative uh, we started in Palm Beach County. The reefs go from in Florida, the reef track is from the Keys up to Palm Beach, and unfortunately, we have a great relationship with the City of Hollywood and their community redevelopment agency, who did fund our first Broward County reef. Uh, mind you, all of this aside from the reefs, and actually, the reefs started as a self-funded initiative. Um, we try to get stakeholder sponsorship and, and we try to get business community support, but we wanted to make these things happen. And like I said, we're very resourceful. Uh, we're going to absorb these costs. We're not going to you know, not do it because we don't have a PR agency to pay. We'll operate as a PR agency. And that's what allowed us to grow and scale uh, this project and all the other projects that we've done as well. Um, I'm going to skip to the next video because we pretty much played some of those, the, these visuals. Um, but that's actually Mary Josh Levy, who uh, came out to dive the reef. And obviously, you can see this is the gift that keeps on giving because they actually, the uh, corals they go in as these sculptures. This was actually a week after they were deployed. And then the algae starts to recruit, which then recruits the corals. And it's a process that does take years. And uh, essentially, the, the short end of it, corals naturally in an ideal environment and temperature can take up to 80 to 100 years to grow. These are artificial reefs. We've developed a bunch of enhancements. We coat them with a carb, uh, calcium carbonate substrate, which helps attract um, baby corals for, for summarizing purposes. And essentially, with uh, the little uh, bumps that we place on there, with, with the patented innovation we developed called a coral lock, we're able to help accelerate coral, uh, the coral growth process for potentially one to two years if the ocean temperatures aren't the hottest that they've been in thousand years, that's another story for another day, but it's a great project we're very passionate about. So that was that. We could have just continued to do all of that. But what we're really here to talk to you about is really our life's work and one of the biggest impacts that we've been able to make. Um, and essentially we're doing art, if you didn't catch, inside of mansions that were for sale. So we worked with real estate brokers. We got involved with the real estate board. Andrew happened to have been a marketing executive for one of the largest shopping center developers and mall operators in the world, West Coast Corporation. And he has developed vacancy management strategies and solutions for malls. He would take the underutilized portion of the food court, and instead of it sitting there vacant and dark, not doing anybody any good, he developed the first commission free art gallery in a mall, in the Broward Mall. And so we're going about this uh, Art for Lardell annual art fair, and uh, Eventually, commercial real estate developers, property managers, and brokers came to us and said, hey, could you do art in our space as well? So thankfully, with Andrew's background and experience with vacancy management, and he literally wrote vacancy management guidebooks for major mall companies, here in the space was born out of that initiative. Yeah, so it was an opportunity for us to essentially take over vacant commercial real estate in our, in our city, in our county, and turn them into affordable artist studios on a temporary basis. It's all month to month until a property owner finds a permanent tenant. So instead of this place staying dark, uh, we're able to actually make the place bright, have working artists in the space, give people an opportunity to actually see art being created. I always say that most people, when they interact with art, they see a finished piece, but they never really see the process. And so you know, it gives an opportunity for the general public to be able to really see art being made, but also for the business community to have a different impression of artists and what artists can do. And then because we make the, the space incredibly affordable in, in, in uh, Fort Lauderdale or in Florida, it's $2.50 a square foot. Actually, in Virginia as well, it's $2.50 a square foot, inclusive of all the utilities, and it's month to month. So these artists don't have a long-term commitment with us. We're also, we, we you know, take care of the typical liability insurance. We take care of paying all the utilities, take care of everything. And they're basically kind of coming in there on a month to month basis. We continue to renew their, um, their leases. And so it's, we started in 2019. We started off with a location in Las Vegas at the time. Las Vegas had, which is our, one of our main sort of fashion-related business districts in our downtown. Uh, they had a, a few vacancies at the time. 
And so we reached out to our local mayor. He connected us with Mike Weymouth, who owns a portion of Las Olas. Mike Weymouth said, great idea. I'll put you into the space. We're in the space there for about three months. Uh, we had a, a plethora of artists actually working in the space. Uh, somebody came into the space and said, oh my gosh, this is great. Love the energy in the space. Can I get the, the, the name of your landlord? Give them the name of the landlord. The person signs a permanent lease. So then it becomes this kind of women opportunity for the property owner because now he's got an opportunity to get the space activated seven days a week. He moves us into another space that was vacant for about five years, exact same scenario. So somebody comes in in the space, says, hey, listen, I really love this space, I really love this energy. And so we continued to like do that process on Las Olas for a while. And then we started getting more outreach from other cities, so local city commissioners, mayors, um, PR agencies, other business developers and owners start reaching out to us. So we've continuously in the last, from, from 2019 to now, we've opened up about 30 different locations, uh, primarily in Florida, but we've also expanded here to Richmond. We have a location at Stony Point Fashion Park. So if you guys, it's about 20 minutes from here, it's a really great, amazing mall down here. And so we have one space there and we have another space in Massachusetts and we're continuing to look at other locations in other cities. We actually are gonna have a meetup <laughs> as you might have seen in the app tonight, eight o'clock. You can go grab a bite, meet us over there. We'll have some refreshments. We'll, we'll have some of the artists there. You can see the activation. And this Stony Point Fashion Park, absolutely beautiful. Is anybody familiar with Stony Point? It's here in Richmond. Absolutely beautiful. But you know, they, they went through bankruptcy, they went through receivership, and they were about 50% occupied. Um, so this activation, not only does it support the artists, give them the opportunity of a lifetime to create in a portion of a retail space. So they don't have to take the entire space. They take 120 square feet on average. Um, they get to be kind of back in college. It's, uh, a lot of the artists refer to it as these cooperative type of environments where the community can come in to discover them. So when we talk about win-win-win benefits, there's a win for the artists. There's a win for the properties because it supports the walkability. It helps keep the feet in the street. It helps retain shoppers in malls and shopping centers longer. And it also provides a win for the community because traditionally artists are trading in industrial warehouse districts, which are generally not going to be walkable, or they're trading at home, and you're generally not stumbling into an art studio. Although we are creating a new art studio initiative this year, during the Art Week, to help people get into artist home studios. So um, that's a you know a little bit at a high level of what we do with zero spaces. Um, we did just want to show. Once again, vacant space, closed doors do not generate positive press. This was our first grand opening reception on Las Olas. Uh, this is one of the widest attended events that we've seen in Fort Lauderdale, over a thousand people in and out of the streets. And if it would have just been another gallery opening and gallery reception, it probably wouldn't have been received the same. But because these are local artists that all have their local friends and followers and supporters come out, it created a unique novelty of the event. Um, it created a very great press opportunity because at the time this really wasn't being done uh, in South Florida or really anywhere throughout the country. We've been very generous uh, that, you know, PBS, NPR, local press, business journals have taken a liking to the concept and um, have helped us extend the reach organically. Um, and this is some of what we're going to cover now in the second portion of this master class to make it interactive and post some of these things back to you. But we just wanted to show you a couple more examples. So once again, we did this. We did not apply for a grant. We did not receive philanthropic funding from a philanthropist. I do not have a uncle, and we are not independently wealthy. We did this bootstrap, very resourceful, as passionate community builders, and creative entrepreneurs, because it's the right thing to do, because those artists kept coming to us and saying, where are the studios at, let alone affordable, um, and these artists are, are just as deserving, but it's very tough for them to get spaces. Our art district in Fort Lauderdale, unfortunately, just got torn down to be redeveloped into condos, which is generally the way the story goes. Thankfully, with this initiative, we're not displacing any artists. Uh, by putting artists in retail environments, we put artists in the largest office building in the state of Florida, in the Boca Raton Innovation Campus, the former IBM headquarters, where there is miles of hallways to line artist artwork, they had empty space. Uh, we helped kickstart their art on brick walls program where we're uh, putting art all throughout the building, which led to a, a permanent space in the building there now, which you can see uh, on display here. Um, and once again, just great visual storytelling, um, great content, great marketing, great branding that 
makes it very inclusive. Um, and you know, people have generally been very appreciative of the concept. So Mike Weymouth is the president of the Los Angeles Company. He's one of the largest owners of our downtown Main Street, which runs from downtown to the beach. Um, and you know, if that space he gave us was vacant for three years. We're in there for three months. Guy comes in to say, I like, uh, says, I like the buzz and energy in the space. And I get the landlord's number. No buzz and energy, probably no lease, especially at that time when there was about 19 vacancies on the us. Um, so obviously the developers, the property owners love us. Um, this gentleman was developing in a little suburb called Oakland Park. Um, really no foot traffic, no activity in his development. And he gave us two spaces next to one another. And now his whole block is full with tenants. We're very happy for him. Um, so they love it. And um, obviously the artists love it. We can honestly, truly say we've changed hundreds of artists' lives thousands of times over. Um, and because generally, traditionally, as you might know or might not know, artists traditionally have to work at home. We keep finding artists are fighting with their spouse or the partner or the family over the kitchen table or the third or the fourth bedroom or the garage or wherever they can find the crate. And then generally, so the way a lot of artists find out about this program, is their partner or family member hears about it in the press and says, honey, here's a great opportunity to get you out of the house. So, uh, and, and, it, and it works. And then also like a lot of, um, in South Florida, there's a lot of retirees. So in some of these spaces, it's really a great way where like the artists, they don't just feel like they're going to work. I mean, they literally are going to work. So those are just some of the success stories, um, but we really wanted to highlight some of our favorite success stories. So um, Anthony Burks is local resident, born and raised in West Palm Beach. He's been a fairly successful artist for about 40 years, but he didn't really start like sailing until he actually got a space with us and he was able to actually bring curators into the space instead of his home. And he eventually ended up getting um, acquired by the Norton Museum. So now we have this local artist that's been you know, creating and the Norton Museum is a huge museum in West Palm, the only, only museum in West Palm. And they collected two pieces from him that's in, now in their permanent collection. So that was the opportunity that he had to bring them into this sort of collective environment, this studio outside of his home that is very low rent, that he's allowed to be able to like bring people in and show people things and be able to have them in this kind of creative environment. And then again, getting, getting collected by the Norton. And, you know, okay, hey, and the, the only living artist that I know that is blessed by me, we're very happy for him. He's the mayor of, of Art in Palm Beach County, started No More Serving Artists Foundation. This artist, working for one of the largest companies um, in Broward County, BBX Capital, an investment banker, she always wanted to paint and got the opportunity to be on Las Olas right down the street from her office. And God bless her, she parlayed that opportunity. She's now making artistic shoes for NBA players, for celebrities, um, literally just had a resurgence of her art that if she would have been doing it at home, it might not have flourished as quickly. One of the other really great success stories uh, that we're very proud to share with Rosanna, she had never done a mural before and her, her child's school, Sunrise Middle, said, hey, you're an artist, you wanna paint a mural? Well, painting a mural is about the same thing as painting a canvas. So, one of her studio mates happened to be one of the most accomplished and successful mural artists in South Florida, the artist for the Miami Dolphins, the artist for the Super Bowl, we'll show you him in a second. And she was able, because of this placemaking initiative, because of this cooperative nature of the program, she was able to turn to her studio mate and say, hey, I got an opportunity to do this thing. I don't really you know, have that skill set. Can you help me? And they collaborated on it. And this was now she's doing major murals uh, at major <laughs> businesses. We couldn't be happier for her. She's a nice woman. Um, third, very successful street artist. Street art is previously traditionally was not able to be monetized. Now artists are getting paid to do murals, not graffiti. Um, but he had never had a public facing studio before. So um, we were just so glad to give him the opportunity. Uh, to have to invite people into the space, and, and he was already doing a lot of collaborations. We can't entirely attribute it to here in the space, but now he's collaborating with Formula One. He was on the Super Bowl video with Pitbull when the Super Bowl came to Miami last time. 
you know, as the artist of the moment. Um, so these are just some of the benefits, some of the success stories uh, that come out of, you know, doing good because it's the right thing to do. These empty spaces aren't serving anything positive in the community. Um, you know, and mind you, they remain on the market. They remain for lease while we're in there. It's, it's fully transparent with everybody that and the artists know at some point, somebody's going to lease the building. You're going to get a third of the notice to vacate. We will work to move them to the next available space. But this is the opportunity of a lifetime because that space at the time was $86 a square foot. The space was 3,000 square feet. No artist is going to pay $30,000 a month to have a studio, you know, even if it is on Los Olas. Just not, it's just not feasible. So we break it down and we make it a pretty easy, transparent process. So yeah, so we activate the vacant spaces. You know, they pay two hundred fifty cents a square foot in, in most of the cities, um, inclusive of all utilities. Uh, and we're in every sort of retail, so street level retail, enclosed malls, uh, lifestyle centers, uh, mixed use development. We've taken over Burberry stores. We've taken over Payless shoe stores, banks. I mean, really any sort of vacant space that's in a commercial space or a commercial environment, we've taken over and turned them into into affordable artist studios. And that's kind of turned into us working with Simon Property Group, Brookfield Properties. So whenever um, a lot of these developers or these shopping centers have sort of chronic vacancies, we get a call and they'll say, hey, can you guys bring artists to our space? So now we're just continuing to expand this whole movement to really love to be in every city around the country and, and other parts of the world. Our space in, uh, anybody familiar with Natick, Massachusetts? Always somebody knows Natick. I had never heard of it. It's a <laughs> suburb of Boston. Uh, basically, it's the largest mall in New England. Uh, the luxury ring in Neiman Marcus was closing. Um, there's a Louis Vuitton there. If there's nothing to support the Louis Vuitton, Louis Vuitton is at risk of pulling out and exiting their lease. So Brookfield Properties, the second largest mall company in the world, brought us in into a former Burberry store. And we now have the first art studio in the world next to a Louis Vuitton where somebody's spending thousands of dollars Leading the Louis Vuitton store says, what's this art studio here? And we just had an artist sell a $5,000 painting from somebody probably would never have connected about. So this is economic impact. This is community building. This is placemaking. This is marketing. Because these spaces, there's constantly press coverage, marketing, images. Uh, we do podcasts with the artists um, to help further tell and amplify their stories. Um, this is a little bit of a process. Mind you, we make it super easy. We only will do this and only can do this with people that want to work with us. We don't knock on any doors. We don't do any outreach. Thankfully, Andrew had a background in shopping center retail development, so we already had a very good reputation in the industry. We started this in partnership with Mayor Dean Trantellis, who's one of the first openly gay mayors of a major city in the country, a big supporter of the arts, big supporter of ours. Um, and that kind of helped with reputability and credibility of the program that allowed Mike Weymouth, the owner of Los Angeles Company, feel comfortable doing this with us. So we communicate with the interested landlord and property owners. Um, we visit the location. We do a little site survey. We make sure it's feasible. It does have to be up to code to a certain extent. We could add a fire exit sign. We could add fire extinguishers. But we can't add a bathroom for $30,000 when we're renting it out to artists. But we're just not going to recoup it at the rate we need it to. Um, but we'll, we'll add lights. We'll add signage. We'll We'll paint the space, we'll make it look nice, and then we basically subdivide a large space into smaller spaces uh, with some of those subdivider walls that we've created. We, one of the biggest holdups, how many of you guys have ever tried to obtain commercial property insurance? It's generally a big stopper for a lot of these projects. We were just at the International Downtown Association conference in Chicago last week, and that was one of the big things. Because we do pay thousands of dollars in insurance because we get an umbrella policy that covers all of these spaces. So uh, we do provide the COI, which generally is what makes the program go through and stops it in a lot of issues, uh, in a lot of instances. And then, um, yeah, we sign a lease. We're generally on a month to month lease. Some properties uh, have other uh, initiatives and other benefits to giving us longer term leases. Um, it looks better on their performa if they have a tenant on a one year lease versus a month to month lease, for, for instance. Um, yeah, we get the space with the code, we get certificates of occupancy, and then um, we generally can build out a 3,000 square foot space in about three days. So we'll fly in on a Wednesday, we'll put the walls up, get everything working, and then we host an open house preview and information session for artists 
that will market to the community uh, through social media, we'll run ads, we'll generally take a membership with the local arts alliance or whatever art organization there is, there's a business team member, and ask them to help us push it out to their members, to the local artists in the community. Um, and once again, we do all these things because they have the right things to do. And I mean, we already kind of highlighted, but to further amplify. Yeah, so you know, obviously, you know, all, all of the benefits, you know, connecting with local artists, all the artists that are in our spaces, all local communities that they're in. You know, we have some artists that essentially, you know, they take one space because it's closer to their house, but then we open another location that might be closer. Because it's month to month, they can leave one space and go to the other space. So it's super flexible. Um, and obviously, as Evan mentioned as well, uh, walkability is another big part of it. You click. Yep. Um, so increasing walkability in areas, you know, whether it's in interior malls in their dead wings or in street level retail in various communities, it's another reason. And obviously the, the owner gets to show the space 24 seven. So seven days a week it's open. They're all artists run. So all the artists are in a space seven days a week. Um, and they kind of like take shifts to see who, who takes what day. They all have 24 hour access to the space, but we kind of require them to keep the space open between the hours of 12 and five, those seven days. And uh, just a little bit of the success story is obviously large reach, collaborations, economic impact. Um, of the artist being able to sell will tell you some more economic impact of some of the other people that we've been able to support nonprofit organizations. A lot of great press coverage, collaborations, podcasts. It really is the gift that keeps on giving. Um, and then in terms of helping to show the space, has anybody ever seen uh, a Matterport virtual reality walkthrough? So, um, you know, once again, we want to provide benefits to the property owners. These cameras, they do cost thousands of dollars. And, um, but it, this is one of the best ways to show the space better than we can tell the space. So we provide Matterport virtual reality walkthroughs for all the spaces. Um, and this is actually going to help us with our next initiative where we're about to launch e-commerce for artists, help the artists sell online. Um, artists continue to tell us that they don't like working with the major platforms, Satchi and Artsy, because they don't generally listen to the users and the sellers' feedbacks. So we're going to address those feedbacks and then make these like clickable. So if you see a painting you like, it'll take you to the artist store. And as we continue to open spaces throughout the country, somebody in Richmond can discover zero for spaces and say, oh, I like that artist artwork in Florida. And we're really excited to launch that. So this is just another perk and benefit that we provide the property owners and the artists alike, because now their studio is able to be discovered in ways that have never been able to be discovered before. It's very interactive. And, um, and some of the artists do classes, um, and we don't take any commission of what they sell. So whatever they sell, they keep. We're just in the business of giving them the space at that monthly rental rate. But whatever they sell, they keep. So this is all sort of a self-sustainable thing for the artists. You know, our goal is to really sort of minimize their expense so they have more time to be creative and more time to be full-time. Uh, I tell people, I'm an artist myself. I kind of start off that way, but I like nice things. So I couldn't be a full-time artist. And so I've spent a lot of time trying to figure out how can artists be full time? So thankfully, we actually now have a couple of artists in our space are up to about six figures a year now. They're, they've quit their second job, and this is literally all they do. So we've been able to like cross that, you know, check that box off, and super happy about that that opportunity. And um, obviously, by, based once again off the uniqueness and novelty of the concept, the press has been very generous. So AB Burks very deservedly so got enormous press coverage um, from being acquired. Um, that building that I mentioned, the Boca Raton Innovation Campus, the former IBM headquarters. I don't know if you guys get the business journal, but office space is not doing very well in the press. Obviously, a lot of companies have not brought their employees back, so office buildings are defaulting on their notes. It's essentially the next part of the real estate crisis. So we're helping support this office building as an emerging art destination with art all throughout the building. We also developed an art leasing program where we'll make local artists artwork available kind of on like a fractional share, fraction shares model. So a, a business or a person or somebody that has a yacht that wants to support local artists can pay 3% value of an artist's artwork on a three, six or 12 month basis. Um, they have an opportunity to buy, we do it as like a lease to own. And then we share those proceeds with the artist so they can retain ownership of the artwork Instead of having it be in their storage or in their studio or in their apartment, now it's going out and doing something positive in the community. Another benefit of the program is 
Uh, you know, Tyrone Square Mall in St. Petersburg, a great, great city for art. This mall has been around for 50 years, wasn't doing so well, um, helped generate some much needed press conference for that mall. Um, NPR has covered it, WL runs a local NPR affiliate. They've covered it on an annual basis. Um, and it was a good story, obviously, uh, before the pandemic, during the pandemic, after the pandemic. And um, the part that, and now this is where we're gonna start turning it back to you guys and we're gonna have some exercises to encourage some ideas for you to bring back to your communities and your destinations and your markets. So a lot of these spaces serve as great venues for nonprofits to host events and fundraisers, which we don't charge to nonprofits. So in this instance, it was a former NFL football player and a former Army veteran that wanted to get together to um, help at-risk youth through the arts. Arts have amazing healing and therapeutic benefits and placemaking. Uh, the benefits of art are, are countless. So um, the press obviously took a liking to that concept. But this one is one of our probably most noteworthy success stories. Um, the Palm Beach Symphony, one of the greatest symphonies in the world, uh, had a bunch of discarded, unusable instruments. And they came to the artist and they said, you know, we want to do something, we want to do a fundraiser. And the artist worked with the symphony, take these discarded instruments and create a musical masterpieces program where they embellish the instruments with their artwork within their own unique style. And then all of these works were on display at the opening event of their season. It was like the Chopsky 15 Symphony, the big event at the private center, the big performing arts center. In Palm Beach, where there's a lot of money, and they did a 50 50 split. Half the money in the proceeds was the artist, half the money was the symphony, raised a ton of money, got a bunch of press. One of the best success stories that we've had. Those are most of the artists that participated. Um, they hosted other events in the space to show and view the instruments. Um, and it's just a, it's a really great thing. So, you now we mentioned a little bit about the leasing. Um, no advisory fees. Um, we have the business or person or yacht owner that will want to lease the artwork. They pay one small flat installation fee. We have a trusted local installer who you know brings the guys in with the booties and the gloves and all that. Um, it's a really great thing. And you know, all we basically do is uh, we ask them to commit to a minimum ten thousand dollars of uh, artwork value, and they pay three percent of that on a monthly basis. So starting at so $10,000 of artwork, 10,000 of artwork, and they pay 3% monthly. So you could pay $300 a month. You could have 10 $1,000 pieces of art. You could have one $10,000 piece of art. And then we'll do it on a three, six, or 12 month basis. And then the, the, the business has an opportunity to purchase it like a lease to own option. And then we split those proceeds with the artist, to put money back in their pocket, in their pocket and um, you know we're really glad to do that. It's a really cool thing. So, and then these are just some of the partners: Diamond Brookfield, two large small companies in the world; Collier's Styles, uh, Westfield's third large small company; Crocker CP Group is largest in Florida. So, um, you know, we're pretty working. If it works for these guys, it should work for your developer or your property. Um, and we're glad to, as we grow and scale this program, bring it to other communities as well. We're glad to be here in Richmond. We will be bringing people by tonight at 8 o'clock for a meetup at our Sony Point Place it, uh, location. It is in the app. We will have some refreshments and we'll have some parts there. Um, so here are just our current locations. Uh, and essentially, we've opened 30 of them, but not all 30 remain open. So some of them have successfully been leased, and that is part of the program. And um, even the one on Las Olas, there, we had a U. Uh, U.S. Air Force veteran that painted an American flag. The last month he was in space, he sold $40,000 of American flag. He was a little upset that the opportunity got taken away from him, but it was the opportunity of a lifetime. He ended up taking that money. He ended up getting his own space, which a lot of the property owners want as one of the goals, uh, which does happen. So this is where we're going to get to the interactive exercise. You guys have pen, piece of paper. You could do this on your phone. You could do this on your tablet. Um, but we want to... We want to include, we, we want to inspire new ideas, include you guys in this exercise as part of this masterclass format. So um, take a moment, your phone, your tablet, piece of paper, whatever the case may be, 
We want to go through just a couple little questions to get the gears turning and maybe see how you might be able to bring these back to your community um, or bring us into your community because we need results and do this work throughout the country now as well. Why don't you kick yourself? So, you know, so the idea is like, you know, for us is that, you know, figure out the name of your place, you know, whatever city or place that you're from, and then, you know, name some things that make your city unique. You know, as I was mentioning, when we were going to do the art fair, we wanted to create this really unique thing that only could happen in Fort Lauderdale. And so what is Fort Lauderdale super well known for is our intercoastal waterways. You know, we're, we're one of those cities called the Venice of America, and it gave us an opportunity to have a differentiator that we'd never really have to compete with anybody else. Now, if we said, hey, we're going to put in a convention center in a tent, they would say, hey, well, you know, they, Art Basel has been going on for 16 years. Art Miami has been going on for 32 years. So, you know, in the media sphere, in terms of publicity standpoint, we actually wouldn't be able to even get into the game. But because we said, hey, listen, we're going to be in luxury waterfront homes on the intercoastal, and you're going to get there by water taxi. So you can't even drive your car. It changes, changes the conversation. And now it becomes a more noteworthy opportunity for journalists to write stories about it. So we always say to try to think about those things that make your place unique and kind of work that into um, in some of the events. So when I said, you know, uh, activities, the art fair was one of those, those activities that we found in another city that we wanted to do, but we wanted to kind of create that unique twist. And we want to make this interactive. So any brave soul that would like to volunteer to help us go through this exercise in real time. There's no wrong answer, and this might actually help you. Yes, thank you, my friend. Oh, and we have this really cool thing if you haven't seen it. Hatchbox. Yeah. Hi. Okay, um, Tracy with Tri Valley, um, East Bay, California. Pleasanton is uh, one of the towns. But we are famous for our wine in Livermore, in the Tri Valley. Um, we have several very small downtowns, so like classic Main Street, small downtowns. And, but what we have the biggest of that's been really growing, and I know there's opportunity here, seeing uh, it, um, we just became major corporate headquarters for, uh, we have grown over 200% plus in um, life sciences. Um, uh, health, IT, um, businesses that are relocated, that are located in our area, building very good campuses, if you will, 10x Jesuit, Workday, it's financial, uh, Zeiss, I stuff. Um, so major innovation and a huge gap between it and our local um, community, but we also have a lot of artists who are struggling to figure out. How's that? I mean, the first idea that comes to mind for me is what if you establish your place as the life science capital of the country? I don't know where that is. That's not my field in my area. And then you could potentially make interactive opportunities to potentially make a life science fair, potentially make this, have an annual conference, have an annual showcase, potentially pair artists with the life science companies. One of the coolest events that we have in South Florida is called Emerge Americas. Just like a technology showcase for Latin America and, and, the, and the Americas. And I'll never forget one of the years I attended, they had um, a whole uh, touchscreen table display that Microsoft invented, which was a human body that was interactive that uh, Florida International University was utilizing to help their doctoral students basically peel back every layer of the human body from the skin down to the muscle and the tissue. And like I thought that was a really cool thing to see. So maybe you could have an Emerge Americas is like a conference. So maybe you could have some emerging life science tech conference where you could have a local artist, maybe the local artist could paint imagery related to those businesses. And this is just off the top of my head. Or even even some opportunities for painting the bottles for the wineries. You know, you could connect the local artists with the wineries. And you create an event where, you know, it might be once a year, there's a, a bottle and a label on a bottle that's essentially a blank label. You open it up to your local artist, and the local artists actually create the pieces. So now it becomes sort of a collector's item, but it also becomes a way for you to kind of integrate the wine, the wineries in your area, and the local artists, but give them an opportunity to be 
to get exposure, and maybe there's some opportunities for them to get paid, which we always love to make sure the artists get paid. Um, so, but I think that kind of creates a really unique opportunity for your wineries. It also creates a really unique opportunity for the artists, and then it creates a really great sort of collaboration. So I think a big key is trying to collaborate with the pieces of, and the people in your community that are able to uh, kind of showcase really amazing things that you guys do. Power of real estate market well, with the local communities. Now, you obviously have this strong connection with the artists in Fort Lauderdale. But what about these other locations that you pop into, like here? Did you have that same kind of connection to Richmond, or well, how did you find it? Uh, there's local arts organizations in, in every community. So there's like a guild, an alliance. We've actually received most of our support here from BCU's art program. So they'll actually help us reshare our contact on their social media to get it into the feeds of their alumni, students, followers, community members. So there is different partnerships. And when we visit, we come into the local community, we spend a couple days, and we'll go set up meetings with the art guilds, with the university, with the local artists, and we'll try to connect with them and see the things that they need and see how that works into our program of shared space. And you know, um, so we're big on being like the conduit. So we love, and oops, left out. We also operate an agency called the United States. Right. Synergistic entities by way of innovation, notoriety, and profit. You might have seen the logo in there at the end of the video. Um, we'll work in different membership-based organizations. So um, we have like a restaurant and lodging. Business. I'm sure they probably had in your market as well, or some um, marketing organizations. And there's been past president of the American Advertising Federation. Uh, so there's and some of these groups are national and they have chapters in respective cities and respective markets. Also, I think there's probably, I know there is wine, winery tourism, but I'm sure there's... Yeah, uh, we know that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there's even more unique and innovative ways. We put together a program with private jets to take people on like quick overnight experiences um, that obviously have the disposable income to pay for that. For very intimate curated experiences that aren't generally accessible to everybody unless you know somebody. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of different ways uh, to do it, and are you, I, I don't have the map in front of you, are you close to Big Sur? No, well, closer to San Francisco and Oakland. I know Big Sur has a really cool art and food weekend, and um, the reason why somebody told me about it is uh, Big Sur does invite people into homes for home kitchen tours and demos and a food event with local chefs, uh, which is pretty cool. So that was unique to Big Sur and to their area. And maybe there's an opportunity, are you familiar with, I'm just ripping here, uh, plain air painting. Okay, maybe there's an opportunity. We do plain air in the vineyards. We have you know, canvas. And amazing how talented everyone is after they've been drinking. <laughs> <laughs> But thank you. Yes. Thank you. Great idea. And by the way, we have a large outlet mall run by Simon, so we'll be fine. Oh, hey. awesome. <laughs> All right. So that was part one. So now part two. And as we were mentioning, obviously, like look at other places and look at things and get inspiration from other areas and then apply the uniqueness of your area to that inspiration that you guys got. Um, and then also, I get to think about partners in the community that can help with the activity. So, we, we don't do any of this on our own. Um, you know, we, we, we try to find other partners that have sort of like-minded agendas and you know, try to like put together and, and sort of uplift everyone. We're big believers in rising tides resource ships. And so you know, we try to like include as many people as possible. There's a lot of people in the community that would come and say, hey, I have this idea. If we think it's a really good idea, we'll go all in and helping promote and support those ideas because it kind of obviously makes the place that we live much better. We don't own the boats. We partner with the water taxi. We are not realtors. We partner with the real estate board. You know, there's different, there's di and there's probably different partners respected. I don't know if there's like an association of the wineries or we, um, we came up with an initiative to kind of do a hybrid of the art fair in zero spaces, but in vacant hotel rooms. And it was, 
actually more advantageous to do it with uh, boutique hotels that generally don't get the shine that the W and the Ritz and, and then get. You know, we found out that there's a superior small lodging association, and they took a lot of interest in it. And we had a very we, we did it during COVID. So the boutique hotels were hurting a little bit more than the bigger hotels. So we put together an event called Arcation. And basically, we had the, the hotels give an artist a week-long lodging in the space. The artist had to create artwork inspired by the location. And they actually had to give the art piece to the hotel and document it on social throughout the entire time that they're there. So the hotel was getting daily posts of the artist creating the piece. The artist is now creating a piece inspired by the location that they're at. The hotel then actually gets the piece to keep. So it created some social media opportunities. It created an opportunity for artists to get a week-long vacation in a really nice boutique hotel, um, Fort Lauderdale and, and Broward County. Um, I'm doing my plugs here. Um, has great boutique hotels. Um, and a lot of them I only discovered with this initiative. Um, so super, super exciting opportunities that um, you kind of sort of stumble upon. And we obviously create everything that we create around art and culture. And so that was an opportunity for us to like, how do we kind of highlight and help these boutique hotels get some press on social media with artists that have a following that would also enjoy the experience of the hotel? Because now you're getting it from a guest perspective, and our guest also happens to be an artist. So you have all these layers of opportunity that are just laid there because there was an opportunity for us to be able to highlight those boutique hotels at the time that were hurting. And then at least an opportunity we like to have parties for a reception to unveil the piece. <laughs> to the guests and attendees of the hotel, as well as other community members and supporters of the artists that wanted to attend the reception to unveil the piece of artwork. Um, so we just sort of really want to encourage you guys as part of this exercise and this masterclass, we really appreciate Richard for stepping this opportunity to um, you know, have this masterclass to engage you guys and hopefully inspire you and leave you with some ideas to think about what a mutually beneficial collaboration with your local government stakeholders and private sector businesses would look like um, and what would be needed to get by and to execute? Because you know you shouldn't do this with your own money. That's not what the book says to do. But there are ways. You know, um, we have seen uh, we have some big annual events in Fort Lauderdale that the city of Fort Lauderdale underwrites and supports the water taxi for our big music festival, Fourth of July, so on and so forth. You can see uh, ways to make it uh, advantageous and mutually beneficial for everybody. Um, and lastly. This is so, <laughs> so we're, we're able to pivot very quickly. So, so we have an idea. We say, hey, you know, we want to help these boutique hotels and we want to create. So Arcation, we create a logo for Arcation. We create a, a page on the website. We create a mission. We create an opportunity for the boutique hotels to have an image and an overview of the hotel with a link to what a hotel is about, a link to the hotel and, and all those kind of things and generate publicity and, 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 and press for the, the, the concept and also a way to actually publicize what we're doing and also publicize the hotel. So those are kind of like the, the, the kind of one, two, three is vision, mission, mission statement, logo, website, marketing, including social media, print, radio, TV, public relations. Um, I think press is um, generating media coverage is, is probably like uh, the most inexpensive way to generate interest in your locations. Um, so I always encourage people to try to connect with people in their local media. Um, we obviously send these pictures to them and, and you know, kind of create it in a way that we're kind of almost writing the story for them in some, some respects so that when, when the journalist or the writer is now pitching it to the editor to see if that's something that they'll cover, um, it's already sort of framed up so it's a little bit easier for them to understand. And then we always, always do video recaps and photo recaps, which are super, super important to be able to sell the idea, but also be able to get people more engaged. And then when we put the topic like this years later, now we have all this great, rich, engaging content, which we also then remix and reutilize and repurpose for other marketing campaigns and strategies and so on and so forth. Um, as we continue to execute, refine, and make changes until each part of the event is perfected. When we started the art fair, um, the boats would sometimes take a little bit longer than the guests and the attendees would like. We listened to the feedback, we continued to work with the water taxi. One year, there was a, something called a blood moon where the tides are higher than ever and lower than ever, and it actually caused problems from the boat, so we try to do it when there's no blood moon. Um, we also realized, too, like some of the newer homes, the 
stock was a little bit higher, so there might need to be a little step for people to get off the boat. Our taxes generally don't go up to these multi million dollar units. Those are just a couple things, and then we're really big on having these be annual events that it sounds a lot better when it's the sixth annual. I mean, obviously, everybody starts with zero, everybody starts with one, um, but second annual, third annual, and then as you kind of saw at the beginning, we do some of these events monthly, annually. Um, we do some of these events even bi weekly. Uh, once again, just to bring people together to foster that sense of place as placemakers as community builders, as creative entrepreneurs, and it's, you know, yielded some pretty good benefits and, and results. Um, and thankfully, we're just spot an opportunity to present here, which we appreciate our partnership summit, our stewardship summit for having us present. Um, how are we doing on time? Okay, I guess we'll open up the questions. Yeah, questions. <laughs> yes. Oh. <laughs> I won't throw it that far. Thank you. That was so inspiring. And I have a million questions. Um, but I will take it from one. Uh, as a Chicago one of the definition of hotels and other local art, and it's not produced by local artists. So have you done any initiatives other than the boutique uh, stay for a week, talk about the art for the hotel, try to get local artists connected with art? Yeah, um, when we started that event uh, at the YOLO restaurant in downtown Fort Lauderdale on Las Olas Boulevard, my art creation uh, on these pop up events was not so much of a thing at that time in 2016, 2017. It's amazing to see this very talented artist live painting here at the conference. And we hope you guys option that to go over call. Um, it inspired a whole wave of live art, and actually, the W Hotel we partnered with started engaging local artists to live paint, and then they actually acquired those artworks as part of their permanent collection. So the lobby of the W, instead of it being that art that you don't care for so much, is artwork created by local artists. Correct. Um, yeah, and then the art leasing gives an opportunity to even bring in more artwork, because fortunately not every um, <laughs> Business hotel uh, will want to purchase artwork, but every business and hotel does have a maintenance budget, and they have a budget to water the plants. Why not have a budget for the local artwork? And you're actually supporting and giving back to the local and creative economy. You're supporting local artists in your community. You're furthering that tie with the with the traveler. With the with the community. With the and I also say the W um, off of that also. Um, started an initiative where someone could get a room and they can also have an artist paint a live piece in their room as one of their amenities on their list of amenities for, for a fee. And um, they actually got a lot of press within that uh, the W, w, w um, Hotels chain for that initiative. So there's a lot of things that come out of that. And the W constantly calls us if they have a, a, a project where they require an artist which they do quite a bit. Um, we're collaborating with them with their Halloween event on the 28th, and uh, we're working with a vodka brand. The vodka brand is bringing the bottles. We're bringing artists, the artists are gonna live paint the bottles at the event. So uh, we've actually kind of gotten the W to be all about bringing in artists and getting them paid. Um, and, and that's a big part of, again, what we try to do is try to make sure artists get paid. So not just exposure, because you can't eat exposure, but we try to get them paid. So, um, there's a lot of like really creative ways that you can kind of incorporate people in your community and kind of uplift the creative people and give them spaces where they could create in some of these corporate environments. And then that, that um, art experience, you don't have to like go online, try to find a local artist, reach out to them. When you're checking out at the W, they have an amenities list and they'll help facilitate, which is actually a pretty cool initiative. We hope more businesses would 